Enter Fall Erin. You can tell because she's wearing flannel now. Hi, I'm Erin Jean McDowell, and welcome to this episode of Bake It Up a Notch Bite Size. In this episode, I'm going to be sharing one of my three favorite gingerbread recipes that I love to make every holiday season. Today, we are going to be making my chewy gingerbread cookies. Now, don't get me wrong. I love a good ginger snap, and I love to make iced decorated gingerbread cookies around the holidays, but I prefer gingerbread cookies that have a little bit of chew to them. So I developed this recipe to kind of be the perfect in-between. They are really chewy and so delicious, but they still hold their shape enough to make into cutout cookies that you can ice for the holidays. These are the only gingerbread cookies you're gonna see me putting into my holiday cookie boxes every year, and I really wanted to share the recipe with you. So let's get baking. This is a really easy recipe, but it does require a couple of extra little bits of effort in some places to get it just right. And the first thing that is a little bit different is that we are going to be using the reverse creaming method. Now, we've talked about the reverse creaming method in past episodes of Bake It Up a Notch, but I wanna just go over it really quickly. In the reverse creaming method, we start by mixing all the dry ingredients together, and then we add the fat, in this recipe it's butter, we add the fat to those dry ingredients and mix it up. Then we start adding the liquid ingredients to combine. The reason that we do this is that to keep these cookies really, really chewy, they have a very high ratio of molasses in them. And it's a little bit easier to get that cookie dough to come together beautifully using the reverse creaming method. If you use the standard creaming method, it's likely to sort of throw that balance off and the dough might even break. So we're gonna start by putting our dry ingredients into our mixer. I'm also going to need an attachment or I'm not gonna mix anything. <laughs> Silly, Erin. First, we're gonna start with the flour. We've got all-purpose flour. And this is a big cookie recipe because I'm making a lot of roll-out cookies, so it's a good amount of flour. We're also going to add our brown sugar into the bowl. Now we're gonna add a bunch of spices. We've got cinnamon, ginger, cloves, allspice, nutmeg, and of course, the ingredient that I think should be in all gingerbread. Some people don't like to put this ingredient in, but I love it, it's just a little bit of black pepper. It makes them extra spicy. We also need some fine sea salt. And of course we need a little bit of baking soda too. Go ahead and mix all these ingredients just for a few seconds to get them nice and combined. Only takes a few seconds to get your dry ingredients and now it's just time to start adding our butter. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of cut it into cubes more or less. And we're just gonna go ahead and drop all of those into the mixer. Now the reverse creaming method works by coating all the fat with the dry ingredients, primarily the flour. That makes it a little bit easier when we add a high ratio of liquid. In this case, we're adding a good amount of molasses. And that high ratio of molasses is gonna keep these cookies so chewy, they are so delicious. But if we tried to make this with the regular creaming method, it just wouldn't be as easy and we might end up with a broken dough. So we're gonna just mix that on low speed until the mixture resembles cornmeal. The butter should be pretty much fully incorporated. I think we're there. You can kind of see that the flour and everything, it looks sort of hydrated because that fat is in there. So it just looks a little bit more um, granular, a little bit like cornmeal. So that's a good sign we're, we're ready to go. I'm just gonna feel really quick with my clean hands and make sure there aren't any big pieces of butter. Once we get to that kind of mealy consistency, we're just going to add one egg, one large egg and our molasses. And as you can see, this is a decent amount of molasses, but stay with me. Wait till you taste these cookies. You're gonna understand. You're gonna understand why we need this much molasses. I promise I would not lead you astray. This is important and use the good stuff. All right, we're gonna mix this on low speed until the dough comes together nice and smooth to combine. Uh, just about one minute. All right, I think our dough is done. It's nice and uniform. I'm just gonna give it a good scrape. I 
I lightly moistened my hands. That's just gonna make it a little bit easier to press the dough into a nice round shape. You can also divide the dough into a few different pieces. That'll make the chill a little bit faster. We're gonna refrigerate it. You can refrigerate it for just a little while, about 30 minutes until it's nice and firm. Or of course you can make it ahead, refrigerate it for overnight or even a couple of days in advance. You're just gonna wanna bring it to room temperature for a little while before you roll it because it will be quite firm when it is chilled. But for now, it's time to go in the fridge. All right, after our chill time, it's time to roll. And I like to roll this dough between two pieces of parchment paper for a few different reasons. One, it is a little bit of a stickier dough if it warms up too much. One of the things that's nice about parchment is it allows you to roll out dough without using too much flour. We can really just use the tiniest bit, just enough that we need. And also when you cut the cookies out, once you peel the scraps away, if the cookies are seeming stuck, you can just leave them right on that same parchment and slide it onto a baking sheet and bake them. If for some reason you have trouble with this, it is completely fine. This dough, while a little sticky, we can absolutely just roll it out with flour. I just like to use as little flour as I have to because it keeps these cookies super chewy and super tender. All right, so a little flour on the top, a little on the bottom. I'm gonna do my first roll here just to incorporate that flour a little bit. Now I'm gonna put my other piece of parchment paper on top and we're gonna start to roll. This is a great time also if you're nervous about the thickness of your dough, you can enlist the help of like the Food52 rolling pin which has these wonderful guides on the side to make sure you have an even thickness. I like to just do it this way and make sure I get the thickness kind of as I go, just checking it. As I work, occasionally I peel the parchment up. I might add a little more flour. And then the other thing that I do is I hold both pieces of parchment at the same time and I flip my little package upside down. The reason for this is that the dough is going to become a little more stuck onto whichever piece is the bottom piece. And by rotating it a lot, we prevent it from getting too stuck and not continuing to roll out, getting too stuck and being like unpleasant to work with as well. So you're just gonna wanna do that a few times as you roll. And like I said, I do usually let this dough soften for just a few minutes out of the fridge. You don't normally hear me say that. I prefer to take dough usually right out of the fridge and roll it. But this is one exception because just a little bit of softening will make a big difference in how easy it is to manipulate this dough. This is when we should cue the the holiday music. Can we get the rights to Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas? Probably not. I probably can't even say Flip. This is a very special bag of cookie cutters that I have. They're all vintage cookie cutters from my grandma and I um, was bequeathed them after she passed away. And they're kind of for a lot of holidays, as you can see. Turkey. <laughs> I believe this is a bunny. <laughs> anyway, that's another best part about the holidays is all those kind of special like heirloomy traditions. And so we'll use some of those today. Once your dough is rolled out, there are kind of two different things you can do. If it feels at all sticky, like when you pull the last piece of parchment off, if it is a little bit sticky, put that parchment back on, slide the whole thing onto a baking sheet and put it in your refrigerator for a few minutes before you cut. Also, if your cookie cutter has a lot of intense details, I recommend going ahead and chilling that dough regardless of if it's sticky or not. It'll just give a little bit more definition to the cookies even when you cut them, and it's always a good idea then to chill them a little bit more before baking for more definition too. But use a floured cutter. You can use anything like round cutters. You can, um, you know, use templates that you print offline and just use a paring knife to cut out different shapes. And see, like this is a great example. See how it's kind of stayed stuck to the parchment? I'm actually just gonna leave it there and when the time comes, I'll take the scrap dough away from it and we'll just bake these right on this baking sheet. I'm 
I'm actually just gonna peel all this scrap dough off of the parchment and we'll bake this right on the parchment paper that we rolled it out on. And of course you can re-roll these scraps several times. Um, I always like to chill the dough again. I want form the kind of scrap dough into a ball and chill it again. It doesn't have to be the full 30 minutes, but make sure it's firm before you continue. I've gone ahead and kind of taken the scrap dough out around from these cookies and I've squished all my excess dough into a nice little disc. I'm gonna refrigerate it again before I roll it out. And this recipe does make several kind of portions. So you can feel free to kind of work in batches. While one is chilling, you can roll out the next and you can chill your cookies and you can kind of have a little assembly line going from the process of rolling, cutting, chilling and baking. I'm gonna go ahead and chill these for a little while so then they're going to be ready to bake. I'm gonna bake these at 350 until they have a nice darker color that's visible around the edge, but just a little bit darker. We do wanna make sure that we bake these until they're just set because that's what keeps them the chewiest. In front of me, I have some of the baked cookies and I wanna talk a little bit more about the doneness of these cookies and what to look for. So you can see, actually this one is a great example of it. You can see that we have some slight darkening around the edges, uh, just like one shade darker around the edges. And that's a really good indicator that it's done. Because this cookie has so much molasses in it, when you do the little touch test to see if it's set, um, it will usually leave an indentation. So that color cue is really your best guidance. And remember that when you're baking cookies, the bake time is gonna vary a little bit depending on the size of the cutter that you're using. So that visual cue is really, really important to getting a really nice chewy cookie. The other key with these gingerbread cookies for a chewy cookie is to not let them cool completely on the baking sheet. I took all of these cookies and put them onto a cooling rack after they had cooled for about five to 10 minutes on the baking sheet. Then I used a spatula, gently transferred them to a cooling rack. That way they can cool with a little more air circulation. Cooling them on the sheet tray, which retains heat, can kind of continue to bake them just the tiniest bit. And you might end up with a cookie that's crisper on the edges than you were hoping for. After your cookies are baked and cooled, of course you can finish them any way that you like. They're wonderful with a little bit of icing on top. You can check out our bite size episode on royal icing for some little tips and tricks on how to decorate your cookies with royal icing. I've been wanting to do kind of a pastel holiday theme this year. So I made some little trees in different hues and I used sprinkles as the ornaments on the trees. And then I had so much fun making these little gnome cookies <laughs> with beards and uh, hats and they're just so much fun. So. Um, you can really obviously have a lot of fun decorating these cookies. And even though it is a softer cookie dough, I really wanted to show that it does retain the shape of the cookie cutters that you use. And you can still get really nice defined cookies even while having a chewy cookie. Finally, if you don't feel like going all crazy with the decorations, I wanna remind you that any cookie is really good if you just slap some icing on it. In this case yesterday, Katie just spooned a few things of royal icing on this, spread it out to the edges and topped it with some sprinkles. We are loving these cookies. <laughs> We've been eating them for breakfast and dessert all day today. They're so, so good. So if you think all this other stuff looks too fancy and intimidating, remember that a little bit of a swoop of icing works just fine without even getting out the piping bag and tips. You should really like and subscribe. This is a great video. Does it sound like a gnome? Yeah. I don't know, maybe they'd be a little grumpier. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Bake It Up A Notch Bite Size, where we talked about my favorite gingerbread cookie recipe there is, these chewy, chewy, delicious gingerbread cookies. I hope that this recipe and this episode gets you inspired to bake. And if you do decide to bake some cookies, be sure to share them with Food52 and I using hashtag Bake It Up A Notch. As always, the recipe is linked in the video description down below. And you can also check out our bite size episode all about royal icing right here on YouTube as well. Be sure to like and subscribe so you can be made aware of new episodes as they become available. And as always, we'll see you next time and wishing you happy baking.